All right, here you are. Deuteronomy chapter 31. We're going to finish the book tonight, so let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the truths that we have learned in the book of Deuteronomy. In fact, for the first five books of Moses as it now comes to a conclusion, the law, the Torah. And we would just ask that you would uh, speak to our hearts tonight as we talk about Moses, as we look a little bit into Joshua, and as we just see the baton being passed. And Lord, you have a word for us tonight, and we want to hear from you. Many of us just need a word of encouragement tonight, or a word of trust, or even exhortation, or reproof. Whatever it is, Lord, we want to hear from you tonight. So bless this time we have in your word, and we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. So here we are, Deuteronomy 31. We'll finish the book, as I said, and we, we called this whole book Remember because that's really what it is. It's really rehearsing, really, the law. Of course, we have a little bit different as we come to the end of the book in these final four chapters. Um, in his book, Spiritual Leadership, which, by the way, is one of my favorite books on leadership, um, Oswald Sanders writes this, True greatness, true leadership is not achieved by reducing men to one's service, but in giving of oneself in selfless service to others. And it is never done without cost. It involves drinking a bitter cup and experiencing a painful baptism of suffering. The true spiritual leader is concerned infinitely more with the service he can render to God and his fellow man than with the benefits and the pleasures he can extract from life. He aims to put more into life than he takes out of it, end quote. That's a good word for any of us that God has called to be leaders, but that is certainly true of Moses, Israel's first really great leader. He was a man who uh, surrendered himself to the will of God, and God used Used him greatly, uh, but as Sanders says, it was not without cost. In fact, the writer to the Hebrews in that great hall of faith in chapter 11 puts it this way. In Hebrews 11, 24, it says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, and he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. And by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was and is invisible. So Moses made a lot of sacrifices, but of course the rewards were, were far greater in seeing what God would do in him and through him. And, and now having brought them to the very border of the promised land, but, as we're going to see, he wouldn't be able to take them in. And so he would be passing the baton to Joshua. And that's really what I would call this message, passing the baton, as Moses is really sharing his last will and testament with the people in these last four chapters, then passing the baton to Joshua. So let's jump in. <clears throat> Verse 1, we read, Then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. And I can no longer go out and come in. Also the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. So uh, he wasn't young, 120, that's up in years. But his age had nothing to do with him being able to go into the promised land. Now he does say here, I can no longer go out and come in. This is not a reference to him being old and even frail. Uh, this phrase is actually used in Numbers 27 and verse 17 in reference to being able to go out and before the people as the leader. Because we know at this point, actually, Moses is in great shape. In chapter 34, he actually climbs uh, the mountaintop by himself. And when he passes away, verse 7 of the last chapter tells us his eyes were not dim, nor had any of his natural vigor diminished. So... Why is God taking his life? Why can't he cross over? Well, we studied this in the book of Numbers in chapter 20. Let me remind you that it says back in verse 2 of that chapter, there was no water for the congregation, and so they gathered again against Moses and Aaron. So this was the typical scenario. Thanks a lot, Moses, for bringing us out here. We're all going to die. We have nothing to drink. So that was the scenario. And so... Moses and Aaron went before the Lord, and the Lord said to him, now here's what you do, Moses, take your rod, 
and gathered the congregation together, and he said, speak to the rock before their eyes. It'll yield water, and, and the water will come on the rock. So it tells us then that Moses took his rod. He gathered the, the assembly of the people together in verse 10 of that chapter and said, hear now, you rebels. So he calls them names. And, and he says, must we bring water out of the rock? Oh, I didn't know you were on the same level as God, Moses. And then Moses lifts his hand, and it says he struck the rock twice with the rod, and water came out freely. Gave water, drink to the people. But then God said, because of this, because you did not hallow me in the eyes of the people, you shall not enter the promised land. So he was disciplined greatly. And so it, this is hard to understand in one sense because, man, the people had mistreated him. They want to abuse him again, and he was just a little angry. But God told Moses to speak to the rock. And at this point, Moses had misrepresented God. Again, he says, he calls them names. Here now, you rebels. He says, you know, must we bring water out? But worst of all, he struck the rock. You say, well, what's so bad about that? Well, we learn more as we come to the New Testament. And we covered this in greater detail when we were in Numbers. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, it tells us that that rock in the Old Testament was Christ. It was an analogy of Christ. And so think about this. The first time the water came out of the rock, uh, Moses struck the rock. And the water gushed out and the people were satisfied. And, and just as that rock in Exodus 16 had to be smitten to give life-giving water, so our Savior had to be smitten at the cross to give life-giving salvation. The cross was necessary. However, once Jesus was smitten, he was never to be smitten again. Hebrews 9.28 tells us that Christ was offered up once for the sacrifice and sins of many. And so as Moses strikes the rock a second time in Numbers 20, he is misrepresenting the analogy that God set forth. God said, speak to the people and it will yield the fruit. And here's the thing. Now after Christ has been smitten at the cross, what do we have to do to receive salvation? All we have to do is speak to the rock. All we have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and we can be saved. So there was a greater judgment on Moses. And so it is for any spiritual leader. In James chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Let not many of you be teachers. And it, it's amazing. And now, having been in ministry for almost four decades, I've seen this over the years. People want to clamor to be a teacher and so forth. But James says, don't do that. Because you need to understand that you will receive a stricter judgment. We need to be careful because when you stand in a place of spiritual authority, you're representing God to the people and there is a higher degree of accountability for that. And for this misrepresentation, Moses couldn't come into the promised land. Now, he encourages the people, though, in verse 3, saying, The Lord your God himself will cross over before you. He will destroy all these nations from before you, and you shall dispossess them. So I'm not going, but God is. God is, so that's good news. And then secondly, he says, And Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord had said. And it was no surprise to the people that Joshua would be the one to do so because Joshua has been Moses' assistant for some time. Moses has been mentoring him and grooming him and discipling him for such a time as this. It was Joshua who led the army in Exodus 17 against the Amalekites. It was Joshua who went up with Moses uh, to receive the Ten Commandments. It was actually Joshua, we read, that when Moses would be in the tent of meeting and then would leave, Joshua would actually stay there lingering in the presence of God. He was a warrior. He was a worshiper. He was also one of the 12 spies that went in the promised land 40 years earlier and only one of two who brought back a positive report, trusting in God. And Moses had discipled him for this day. And, and let me say this, that's an essential part of leadership as well, just as a side note to disciple other people to carry on the work. I mean, you think about Jesus. Jesus discipled 12 men, right, to carry on the work. We're told that Peter discipled John Mark. We're told that Paul discipled Timothy. And God calls us all to disciple other people. There's a great verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul says this, And the things that you heard from me, commit these to other men who will be able to disciple others. So there's actually four generations mentioned there. Paul is speaking to Timothy. So Paul, first generation, speaking to Timothy, second generation, says, the things you heard from me, now you take and you teach other men, that's third generation, who will then disciple others, that's fourth generation. So this is something we're all to be involved with. 
Discipling. Somebody ask you, how you doing? How you doing on that? Everybody looks at, well, you're the pastor. You're supposed to be doing the discipling. Yeah, but we're, we should all be pouring into somebody's life of what we've learned, of what we've learned. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be a sit-down form. Okay, sit down, get your pad and pencil. I've got some things to share with you. Most of your friends will say, you're nuts. I'm out of here. But if you actually are just have someone who's a Christian around you who knows less than you, you have something to pour into their life. And just, I mean, it's just, it's just giving of your life to them so they can grow. And, and, of course, you want to find someone who wants to learn. If someone doesn't want to, well, then they're not a disciple. The word disciple means learner, someone who wants to learn. They're teachable. They want that. But we need to pour into people. Now, verse 4 says, The Lord will do to them, that's the inhabitants of Canaan, as he did to Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites, in their land when he destroyed them. So just as you're going to go to the promised land, God's going to do the same thing to the men that he did on this side of the Jordan. The Lord will give them over to you that you may do to them according to the commandment which I've commanded you. In other words, you're going to obliterate them. So be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Now, the people were probably a little fearful. I mean, because Moses is dying, right? And they know what awaits them when they come to the promised land. They remember what the spy said. These people are bigger than us. They're badder than us, right? They're stronger, right? We're like grasshoppers in their sight. So Moses needs to encourage the people. Hey, the Lord is the one that's going with you. And he's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. It's a good word. Some of you need to hear that tonight. That's just for you. So you need to know God is with you. I, I love God's word to Jehoshaphat, the king at the time, in 2 Chronicles 20, 15. He told him too, don't be afraid, Jehoshaphat. I know it's a massive army and it looks like you're going to die. But look at the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. And he encouraged him. So Moses is encouraging the people. But not only did he need to encourage the people, he needed to encourage Joshua. It's because it says then in verse 7, he called Joshua. So he encouraged the people, and then he says to Joshua in the sight of Israel, you be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. So guess what, Joshua? You need encouragement as well. And, and, and that, what a daunting task. I mean, you're taking, you have this great leader that's been leading the people for 80, you know, 80 years. And now, you know, he's off the scene and it's like, okay, you're the guy. That, that would be like, wow, you know. But here's the thing. Joshua was up to the task. Joshua was a man whom God could now use. And, and this is what we want to aim for as believers. You know, maybe it's not that huge of a task, but just we want to be used by God. And there's a verse that speaks of that. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul says, you know, in a house, if you have a, and he's really, he says a great house, so like an estate, but it, we could say that of our homes because we're, we're wealthy compared to most nations around the world. He says, in a great house, there are many vessels. Some of our gold, some are silver, but some are wood and clay. Some are for honor and some are for dishonor. And we get that, right? In your home, you have china that maybe you got when you first got married. I don't know. That's only the time most people buy china when they get married. And then it just sits there. And every once in a while, maybe we'll bring the china out, you know, or silverware. But you have some nice stuff. You have vessels of honor. When you bring guests, you get out the best stuff. And then you have vessels of dishonor in your home. You know, that might be the scrubber that you use for the toilet. That's definitely a vessel of dishonor, right? <laughs> So we understand that. And then he says this. Paul says, Therefore, if anyone will cleanse himself from the latter of sin, he's going to be a vessel for honor, useful for the master. So we want to be useful vessels, right? And that's what God saw in Joshua. He was a useful vessel. And so he encourages him. Be strong and courageous. God has chosen you. In verse 8, and the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He'll not leave you. He'll not forsake you. So don't be fearful or dismayed. And that's so encouraging. We, so many times we need to hear that. God is for us, not against us. Now moving on to verse 9. So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. So every seven years during what is called the Feast of Tabernacles, which commemorated God's protection of them in the, in the, the wanderings in the wilderness, then I want you to assemble all the children of Israel and they need to hear you read all the law, all five books in one sitting. How about that? 
Gather together people, men, women, little ones, stranger in your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord. And they revere God carefully and observe all the words of the law, that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you go over to cross Jordan and to possess. By the way, we have an example of this. So if you want to, you could turn there. That's Nehemiah chapter 8. It's really a great chapter to look at because it gives us an example of expository teaching. And so if Nehemiah chapter 8, and, and so people go, well, what do you do? I teach verse by verse. That's what we call expositional teaching. So in Nehemiah 8.1, Ezra is gathering all the people of Israel. He was the priest at that time. And he was before the, the water gate. And it tells us in verse 1, he brought the book of the law of Moses, which was commanded in Israel. And the high priest brought the, Lord bef uh, the law before the congregation of both men, women, and all who could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. So he's actually doing what we're reading about here in Deuteronomy. And he read before the street that was before the water gate, listen to this, from morning until midday. That, that's, that's not a short reading. That's from morning. That's probably four to six hours. He was just reading the Bible. And check this out. He was doing it, and it tells us the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. Is that incredible? And they were like, wow, on the edge of their seat. Really? I mean, I have a hard time teaching people 45 minutes without some of them every once in a while doing this. I kid you not. Can I do this? Can we be honest right now? Because we were just talking about this not too long ago. We've actually found fingernail clippings in our sanctuary on several occasions. I don't know who that is, but you're disgusting. That's just gross, right? Can I be honest? If you're sitting in a church and you're doing this number, I, I doubt you're paying attention to what I'm doing. So anyway, I just got to give the example here that here we got Ezra, and he's reading. The, I know some of you can't get over that, right? You're just going to be thinking about someone doing that. I know, right? Someone's like, oh, I hope they don't know it's me. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> so look at verse 5. If you're there in Ezra, uh, I mean, Nehemiah 8, it says, Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Like, there was this reverence. Oh, he's, he's going to read the word. And he blessed the people, and everybody worshiped the Lord. Their faces then went to the ground. And it tells us, verse 7, the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and they stood in their place. And here's what we get, Nehemiah 8, 8. So they read in the book of the law distinctly, and they gave the sense, and they caused the people to understand the reading. So here's what they did. They read the word, they explained the word, and then they applied the word. That's exactly what I do every Sunday and Wednesday. That's expositional teaching. You read the word, you explain the word, you apply the word. Now, you go back to Deuteronomy 31, but that's what they're doing in context. They're fulfilling what Moses told them to do every seven years. Then the Lord said to Moses in verse 14, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of meeting that I may inaugurate him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of meeting. Now the Lord appeared at the tabernacle in, the pillar, in a pillar of cloud. Which is pretty awesome. That's God's Shekinah glory. The same glory that led the children of Israel in the wilderness now is hovering over them. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers. Hey, guess what? You're going to die. That's what he's telling them, you know. But you're going to rest with your fathers. You're going to go with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know. I'm going to take you home soon. But here's what he tells them, and this is sad. The people will rise. I just want you to know the future of Israel. People will rise and play the harlot with other gods of foreigners of the land where they go among them, and they'll forsake me and break my covenant, which I've made with them. Then my anger shall be aroused, uh, uh, aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them, and that they may be devoured. And many evils and troubles will befall them, so that they'll say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? And I'll surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil that they've done in that they turn to other gods. So this is a prophecy in the future. They're going to go after all the gods of the land. Tragic. And it did happen. Now, therefore, write this down in a song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. So he's going to have them write a song. We're going to see that in the next chapter. 
When I brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, of which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat, then they will turn to other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my commandment. Then it shall be when many evils and troubles have come upon them that this song will testify against them as a witness. For it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants. For I know the inclination of the behavior today, even before I brought them into the land which I swore to give them. Now, to me, that speaks of God's grace. He's, God is basically saying this. I know everything they're going to do, and they're going to blow it. But I love them anyway, and I'm going to bring them into the land, and they're going to blow it. But I'll forgive them, and they're my kids. I don't know if that sounds like you, but it definitely sounds like me. I love the fact that God knows and has known, and yours as well, all of my sins, past, present, and future, and he still has set his love on me, knowing all the horrible things I have done and will do. And he's forgiven me. And he's still set his affection upon me. That's a staggering thought. Man, what, what grace, what love. So Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel, verse 22. Then he inaugurated, verse uh, 23, Joshua the son of Nun. Uh, be strong and good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore them, and I will be with you. By the way, you notice he says it again, be strong and courageous. He says it seven times. It's three times in this chapter, and then four times when we get to Joshua chapter 1. And so it was when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book that they were finished. And so the book was complete, and Moses commanded the Levites who wrote or who bore, I'm sorry, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. Now, later on, we do read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9 and verse 4, that the Ten Commandments, along with Aaron's rod that budded, and some of the manna were actually placed within the ark. And then the remainder, not you know, only the Ten Commandments put in, but the entirety of the law then was placed beside of it because of it was such a large scroll. And it was placed there as a witness. Why? Verse 27, For I know the rebellion of your stiff neck. If today while I'm yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, then how much more after my death? <laughs> so Moses say, Man, you've been bad enough while I'm alive. I can't imagine what it's going to be like when I'm dead. And God said you're going to rebel. So, verse 28, Gather to me all the elders of your tribes, your officers, that I may speak these words in their hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will become utterly corrupt. Turn aside from the way which I commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of the Israel the words of this song until they were ended. And so here's the song. It's in chapter 32. There are four major divisions. The first thing he does is he begins with the greatness of God, which is good. Verses 1 through 4. Get ear, O heavens, and I'll speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as rain, my speech distill as dew, as raindrops on the tender herb and as the showers on the grass. And so obviously he's extolling God, but he's using, of course, poetic language. For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. He's the rock. His work is perfect. His ways are justice, a God of truth without injustice, righteous and upright is he. So he begins with the greatness of God in this song. Great thing to, to teach your kids. But then he reminds the people of the faithfulness of God. Verse 5, they've corrupted themselves. They are not his children because of their blemish, a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus deal with the Lord of foolish and unwise people? Isn't it foolish to rebel against God, in other words? Is he not your father who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? Remember the days of old. In other words, look at God's faithfulness. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father. He'll show you. The elders, they'll tell you. When the Most High divided our inheritance to the nature, nations, when he separated the sons of Adam and set boundaries of the people according to the number of the children of Israel, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. Man, God has been so good to the nation. He found him in the desert land, in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. 
God raised you up to be a nation from being nobodies. He encircled them and he instructed them. He kept them as the apple of his eye. As the eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. So the Lord alone led him and there was no foreign God in him. And he does this all the way down to verse 14. Just speaking of God's faithfulness. But then in this song, it has a, a third part, and that's speaking about their rebellion. And hence, now God talks about his chastening, beginning in verse 15. But Jeshurun grew fat and thick. You are obese. Now, first of all, the term Jeshurun, uh, it's a title for Israel. It, it, it means the upright ones. I mean, God's, that's how God looked at his people. But, you know, you, got, you just got... You got full of yourselves is what he's saying. And you forsook the Lord who made him and scornfully established the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed, check this out, they sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. So we know that when they came in the land, they started to follow after the other gods of the Canaanites. But I do want to speak about the fact that they sacrificed to demons. You don't read about that. You don't see, oh, there's a demon. Let's sacrifice to them. But Paul gives us a commentary of this. In 1 Corinthians 10, 20, he says this, that when a person sacrifices to an idol, they are actually sacrificing to the demons behind the idol. So when you think about today, people, there are shrines in many different cultures around the world. I've seen many of them. I've seen various gods that people bow down and worship to. They're bowing down to demons because it is the demonic influence behind that that causes a person to make an idol to say, worship this instead of the true God. Pretty radical when you think about it. Uh, you've forgotten the rock who begot you, in verse 18. You're unmindful. You've forgotten the God who fathered you. So you've, you're, you've rebelled against your spiritual father in heaven. And when the Lord saw it, he spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and daughters. And he said, I'll hide my face from them. I'll see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children of whom there's no faith. They've provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger with their foolish idols. And he talks about all of this all the way down to verse 34. Uh, if that was a modern song today, you would go, boy, that's really not a very cheerful song. I, 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 that's a, why are they playing that on KSBJ? That doesn't sound very uplifting, you know, or whatever you'd like to listen to, you know. But it's, it's a song of remembrance from them to speak about where they've gone and what they're going to do. And then finally, because of that, you have God's vengeance, believe it or not. And God talks about it. Vengeance is mine, and I'll recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things will come to hasten upon them. For the Lord's going to judge his people. Notice he's not in ju judging the inhabitants here, but it's his own people. And have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there's no remaining bond or free. He will say, where are their gods? The rock in which they sought refuge. So in other words, if, if these are your gods you want, let your gods rescue you. And well, we come to the end of the song down in verse 44. So Moses came to Joshua, the son of Nun, spoke all the words of this song in the hearing of the people. Here, I've written this composition. Sing this, teach this to your kids. And Moses finished speaking all these words to Israel, and he said to them, Set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe all the words of this law. For it is not a futile thing for you, because it is your life. And by this word you shall prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. So not only do you mean to memorize this song, but you need to memorize God's word. It's your life. It'll change you. If you get off it, you'll lose your life. And then the Lord spoke to Moses that very same day, saying, Go up this mountain of the Abraham, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, across from Jericho. So they were right there, right across from Jericho. View the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel as a possession, and die on the mountain which you ascend. And be gathered to your people, just as Aaron, your brother, died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. So he would be allowed to view the promised land, and then he would pass away. And why is that? Again, he rehearses it, verse 51, because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin, because you did not hallow me in the midst of the children of Israel. Yet you shall see the land before you, though you shall not go there, into the land which I am giving to the children 
of Israel. And so we come to chapter 33, and here uh, we have Moses' last words to the people. And what he does is he actually blesses each of the tribes. And uh, this is very similar if you compare it with Genesis chapter 49. In chapter 49, you have Jacob, Israel, blessing all the 12 tribes of Israel. Those are his 12 sons. Now, keep in mind, Moses was the one who wrote that down. Remember, Moses wrote that down in Genesis. So it's not a stretch to believe that under the whole inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's kind of consciously modeling his blessing from Jacob's, which he had recorded earlier, and now at the end of this book, speaking of the God's blessing on these tribes. Now, this is the blessing, verse 1, which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From the right hand came a fiery law from him. So God gave his law to his people. He loves his people. All the saints are in your hand. They sit down your feet. Everyone receives your words. So as he's talking about blessing, he says the greatest blessing we have is his word. And by the way, it's that for us today. The greatest blessing we have is God's word. He communicates to us. He speaks to us. So Moses commanded a law for us, a heritage of the congregation of Jacob. And he, and he was king in Jeshurun. And when the leaders of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. So again, he's extolling God's greatness and the fact that he gave us the word. And his first blessing comes to Reuben. Let Reuben live and not die. Let his men be few. Reuben was firstborn. And so that would make sense. The second tribe, of course, is Judah. Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah and bring him to his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him that you may help him against his enemies. And, of course, Judah is the royal tribe from which the Messiah would come. So protected by his enemies. And then of Levi said, let your thumbin and your urim be with your holy one whom you tested at Massa and whom you contended at the waters of Meribah. Now, those are kind of two strange words. So if you haven't followed with us through... Uh, you know, the book of Leviticus and even um, Exodus, the thumb and the urim are kind of interesting words. And uh, the words mean lights and perfections. And we know that when the high priest's garment was made, he had a breastplate. He had an ephod, which is kind of like a vest, and then he'd have a breastplate made with tw uh, 12 different colored stones, and these represent the 12 tribes. And underneath the breastplate was a little pocket where he would keep the thumb and the urim. And there were two stones, one white, one black, and these were used in various situations for ascertaining the will of God in certain situations. So that's what he's referring to. He says of his father and mother, I have seen them, nor did he acknowledge his brothers or know his own children. Uh, the idea that the Levites have to, had great sacrifice because they were the ministry tribe. For you observe the word and you've kept your covenant. They shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. They shall put incense before you, the whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the work of his hands. Strike the loins of those who rise against him and those who hate him, that they rise not again. So a special blessing on Levi as being the uh, tribe that would be involved in sacrificial service. And then he blesses number four, Benjamin. Of Benjamin, he said, The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him who shelters him all day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. And if you read about the Benjamites, uh, they were mighty warriors. And uh, those who would be with Benjamites, very, very safe. And then the fifth tribe, Joseph, Blessed uh, of the Lord is his land with the precious things of heaven and dew and deep lying beneath, with precious fruits of the sun, with precious produce of months, with the best things of the ancient mountains, with the precious things of the everlasting hills, with the precious things of the earth and its fullness and the favor of him who dwelt in the bush. Let the blessings come on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separated from his brothers. Remember, put into over into Egyptian slavery and so forth. His glory is like a first born bull and his horns like the horns of a wild ox together with them he shall push the peoples to the ends of the earth they are the ten thousands of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh so really the blessing of Joseph Joseph received a double portion so he receives the blessing of the fifth and the sixth tribe Ephraim and Manasseh and then of the seventh tribe, Zebulun rejoice Zebulun in your going out and verse 8 Issachar that's the eighth tribe 
These two kind of go together. Shall call the peoples to the mountain there. They shall offer sacrifices of righteousness. For they shall take of the abundance of the seas. And the treasures in the hidden land. And both Zebulun and Issachar are, are dwell around the shores of Galilee. And so they took advantage of that and were enriched because of that. And then the ninth tribe, Gad. Blessed is he who enlarges Gad. He dwells as a lion and tears the arm and the crown of his head. He provided the first part of himself because a lawgiver's portion was reserved there. He came with the heads of the people. He administrated justice and his judgments like Israel. Um, Gad is said to have like a lion-like character. During the rulership of King David, uh, they furnished some of the finest troops for David. And then Dan, the tenth tribe, Dan is the lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. Now that's interesting because Dan, when it's first allotted the land, we'll see this in Joshua, is situated in the south. But later on, a group of them migrated towards the north and Dan settled in the north. It's a very fertile area. It's the area of the Golan. You hear of the Golan Heights and the area of the Bashan. Unfortunately, because of Dan settling there, they, they settled on the edge of Israel's territory and they were the first to invite idolatry into the land, which is a tragic thing. And for that reason, when you read the book of Revelation, you will find that they are not mentioned as the tribes of the 144,000. And then Naphtali, verse, uh, is the 11th tribe, verse 23. O Naphtali, satisfied with favor, the full blessing of the Lord possessed the west and the south. And again, Naphtali is, in, is really located on the area of the Galilee where Jesus did most of his teaching. And then finally, Asher, he said, Asher is most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers and let him dip his foot in oil. That, that speaks of wealth. So they were blessed. The sandals of iron and bronze as your days, so your, shall your strength be. And so God uh, blesses these tribes through Moses. And then Moses concludes praising God, saying, There is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides the heavens to help you and in his excellency on the clouds. And again, uh, it means the upright people, Jeshurun, and used as a, just a, an endearing name for Israel. And Moses continues, The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy. So if you put your trust in God, he's going to disperse these lands as you come to Canaan and you will prosper. Then Israel shall dwell in safety, the fountain of Jacob alone in the land of grain and new wine. His heaven shall drop as dew. Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. In other words, they were redeemed by God. And of course, uh, that's how anybody is saved. We can only be saved by the Lord, redeemed by him. The shield of your help, the sword of your majesty, he protects you, he sustains you. Thus your enemies shall submit to you and you shall tread down their high places. So he concludes by talking about God's greatness because it is God that will bless them. And again, keep in mind, God is doing this and saying this through Moses, even knowing that down the line they will fall away from him. And then we come to the final chapter. And we read, then Moses went up, after he's done, these are his final words, right? So now Moses um, went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, which is to the far north, Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, which would be the Mediterranean, the south, the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of the palm trees as far as Zoar. So he basically just does a, you know, a 360. He, he gets to see the vista of the entire promised land. That, that must have been just something awesome to see. Then the Lord said, this is the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. This had to be, for Moses, a bittersweet, right? I mean, sweet in the fact that he gets to see, you know, a fulfilled prophecy that has taken, uh, you know, hundreds of years. 430 years just of slavery in Egypt. And then, the, you know, uh, then all the years prior to that when God began it to speak it through Abraham and then later through his uh, son and grandson. And so uh, sweet to see it, but bitter in the fact that he would not go in. So verse 5, I love this verse. The servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. The reason why 
<clears throat> I love this verse, and I would just like to hone in this for a moment, is because I just want you to think of the accomplishments of Moses. Moses was a prince of Egypt. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. We see uh, all that, you know, the ruins of Egypt. We know how the, the grandeur of it all. He was a prince of Egypt. He was the deliverer of God's people. He, he was a shepherd in the wilderness of both animals and men. He was the great statesman and spokesman for God. He was a miracle worker. God used him to do miracles. He was a prophet. He, he was a man whom it says spoke to God face to face. He was a man that actually saw a portion of the glory of God, so much so that when he came down the mountain, his face shone from being in God's presence. Uh, not to mention he wrote the first five books of the Bible and is the great lawgiver. Pretty amazing. Yet with all of those accomplishments, I mean, there's so many of them, as he dies, his epitaph here by God himself is not, Moses the prince, Moses the shepherd, Moses the, the deliverer, or Moses the miracle worker. Rather, you know what we read? Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. There is no higher honor that can be placed on a person, on a child of God, higher than saying that was a servant. That's, that's God's highest honor of commending a person. That's the highest honor. I mean, when we pass from this life, when we pass from this life, the words that we want to hear from our Savior are what Jesus said. When we pass from this life, to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. I mean, think about that. Romans 6, says, we've been set free from sin to be servants of God. And I, and I just emphasize that because... I have to look at myself and ask myself, how am I doing on that? How are you doing? What are you, what are you living for? I mean, you can have all kinds of accomplishments. You can do all kinds of great things. But when it comes down to it, God is just wanting a faithful servant. That's really what he wants. Jesus said in Mark 10, 42, you know those who are considered rulers among the world? They lord it over them. Great ones in this world exercise authority over men. But that's not the way it should be among you. If you want to be great, be a servant. And if you want to be first, be a slave. Wow. Moses lived like that. With all the accomplishments he had, God says he was a servant. He had a heart for God. He had a heart for God's people. And so God says, my servant Moses has died. Oh, man, would to God, that's what we'd be known as. And then we read in verse 6, And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, and no one knows his grave to this day. Now who's the he in verse 6? He buried him. Well, that's God. God buried Moses, so we don't know where he's at. Moses' death is surrounded by mystery, and that is very interesting because of some of the things that we read then later in the New Testament. One particularly interesting is found in the book of Jude, verse 9. It says this, yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses dared not bring a reviling accusation but said the Lord rebuke you. Now in context the main emphasis of Jude is authority. Even as powerful as the archangel Michael was he did not come in his own authority against Satan but he said the Lord rebuke you. But the question we have to ask is, why is Michael contending with the devil for the body of Moses to begin with? We don't know. Just thought I'd throw that out there for you. <laughs> there are some suggestions. One is perhaps Satan wanted to use the body of Moses to kind of use as an act of worship to lead people into idolatry. Listen, people held up the, 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 the bronze snake, remember, that God used to heal the people? They carried that around for years and worshipped it. What if they had the body of Moses, you know, the bones of Moses? They'd probably, you know, they'd probably venerate him and fall down and worship. Oh, by the way, people do that today. I, I've been to churches. Hey, the finger of the Apostle Paul's in this box. You know, we call them relics. And they're in churches all across Europe. Or a piece of the cross here. And people, oh, you know. It's like, hey, that's a rotten, that's a rotten toe. There's like, there's like I'm not kidding. You, you see some radical relics. If you don't believe me, just do an internet shirt, uh, search. You'll be blown away. So that's a possibility. Or perhaps 
Satan was concerned that Moses might be showing up on a future occasion. Because that's exactly what happens. Because Moses does show up on a future occasion. In Matthew chapter 17, Moses, along with Elijah, who, by the way, didn't die either. Most, Elijah didn't die. He was taken up in a fiery chariot, kind of interesting departure. Both of the guys show up in Matthew chapter 17 when Jesus is transfigured before him. And we see them both later in the book of Revelation. So just kind of an interesting thing about the body of Moses, and no one knows where it's at, and what God did afterwards, who knows? Anyway. Verse 7, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim. His natural vigor was not diminished. In other words, he was still strong as an ox. But he had to go home. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 years. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. 30, year, uh, 30 days, they said, they just, you know, it's a time to honor him. Then it's time to move on. So Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, so the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. So by the way, this speaks of Moses' leadership. He had faithfully discipled another man to take his place so that when he passed off the scene, they recognized him as the next leader. But... Since there and there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, and all signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before all of his servants, and in his land, and by all the mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of Israel. So he was a mighty man of God. In fact, listen, in many respects, uh, Moses is a type of Christ. You see, like Jesus, Moses was born in a godly home, but during difficult times just like Jesus. Moses' life was threatened at birth, as Jesus' was at his birth at the hands of Herod. We're told in Hebrews chapter 11 that Moses forsook all the treasures of Egypt to become poor and associated with his people. We're told that Jesus laid aside all the riches of heaven to become poor that we might become rich in him. Moses was rejected by his people when he tried to come to them the first time. Jesus, of course, was rejected by his people the first time he came. Of course, in his second coming, He'll be received in by many. Moses' face shone when he was on the mountain with God, a reflection of God's glory. Jesus' face shone when he was transfigured on the mountain. Of course, his was not a reflective glory. His was a radiant glory from within. And of course, as we see here at the end of chapter 34, Moses trained Joshua to continue the work. Jesus trained his disciples to continue the work. So a lot of similarities. But here as we close the book, this book of remembrance, man, there are a lot of things that I could take away. I, I just want to kind of close just with this, that last thought we did in this chapter uh, about being a servant. Let me close with the words of Thomas More. He has such good words. There's a lot of depth in it. He says this, No man ever lost anything by serving God with a whole heart, nor gained anything by serving God with half a one. So listen, if you are going to serve God and you're just doing it half-heartedly, there's not much there. The only way to really serve Jesus is all in. You're all either all in or you're not. <laughs> to try and be one foot in Jesus, one foot in the world is not, that's, that's half-hearted. You really want the full blessings that come, it's wholehearted, serving him with a whole heart. So Man, that would be my prayer for us. That, you know, how many days we have left on this earth. We don't know how many days we have left. I mean, you know, we say days, I think I have years. Yeah, but those years are actually days. Think about it. For some of us, I know for sure, I've probably lived more days already than I have left on this world. So with the days I have left, I want to be a servant of Jesus. Let's pray.